Well, I'm not an expert. I'm not an authority. I'm someone who has been a murderer for almost 20 years. Can you say how many people might be doing crimes like you were doing? It would be a guess, but it's, not, it's far more than 35. It isn't that impossible in this society. It happens. Are there more people? They didn't give up. Uh, how he, many? she didn't give up. I did. I came in out of the cold. And what I'm saying is there are some people who prefer it in the cold. Good people see. A nice guy. Did you like Kemper? I like Kemper. You were able to appear like a, an ordinary person, non-threatening to... I lived as an ordinary person most of my life, even though I was living a parallel and increasingly sick life, other life. One victim let me back in the car. I locked myself out. She opened the door for me. My gun was under the seat. What in the hell am I doing telling you that? Am I looking, am I, am I a masochist? Am I looking to be tormented further? I'm trying to show you just how awful this got, how commanding these rages got. I was raging inside. There was just incredible energies, positive and negative, uh, depending on a mood that would trigger one or the other. And outside, I looked troubled at times. Other times, I looked moody. Uh, other times, perfectly serene. Not very sane. But again, people weren't even aware of what was happening. In 1972 and 1973, a series of murders shocked Northern California. College girls began to disappear while hitchhiking. Two of the victims were picked up from the campus of the University of California at Santa Cruz. That's where Ed Kemper's mother was working as an administrative assistant. You were involved in the campus because your mother worked there? Yes. I was also involved in killing co-eds because my mother was associated with college work, college co-eds, women, and had had a very strong and violently outspoken position on men for much of my upbringing. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. And I watched the alcohol increase. I watched her social life drop off. I watched her get bizarre. She had terrible pain from her life, earlier life, her upbringing, uh, a failed marriage with my father. I'm a constant reminder of that failure. I hate to distill it down into such uh, into one word realities like that. There's a lot that leads into that happening, but that is what happened. They represented not what my mother was, but what she liked, what she coveted, what was important to her, and I was destroying it. Why did you actually kill the girls? My frustration, my inability to communicate socially, sexually. I wasn't impotent, but emotionally I was impotent. I was scared to death of failing in male-female relationships. I knew absolutely nothing about that whole area. Even if just sitting down and talking with the young lady. I need to be able to really communicate, and ironically enough, that's why I began picking people up. And I'm picking up young women, and I'm going a little bit farther each time. It's a daring kind of a thing. At first there wasn't a gun. I'm driving along. We go to a vulnerable place where there aren't people watching, where I could act out, and I say, no, I can't. And then a gun is in the car, hidden. And this craving, this awful, raging, eating feeling inside. I could feel it consuming my insides, this fantastic passion. Uh, it was overwhelming me. It was like drugs. It was like alcohol. A little isn't enough. At first it is. And as you adjust to that, psychologically and physically, you take more and more and more. It's the same process. So it finally came down to the thing of, do I dare bring this gun out? Already realizing if that gun comes out, something has to happen. It was going to happen. I didn't see it then, but it was going to happen. I was playing a dangerous game with a loaded gun. It got us all. On one occasion, Kemper picked up two roommates in Berkeley. And 
their first killing in May of 72. When that gun was pulled out, I launched it out. For it. I had it under my leg, out of sight, parallel to my, to my leg in the seat. It was something that had been thought out in fantasy, acted out, felt out hundreds of times before it ever happened. Kemper drove them at gunpoint to a secluded area near a park. He took one of them into the woods, leaving the second girl tied in the car. I just gone through a horrible experience with her roommate stabbing her. And I was in shock because of that. I couldn't believe that it was that way. And I'm walking back there bewildered. I gotta kill her. I can't let her go. She's gonna tell on me. Everybody's gonna get me. She sees the blood on my hands. What are you doing? And she pulled back and she gasped. And I think, whoa, I don't want her to know what happened. I said, your friend got smart with me. She'd been getting really smart with me a lot, but I never hit her. I killed her, but I didn't hit her. I said, your friend got smart with me and I hit her. I think I broke her nose. You better come help. She's about to die. Why, do, why does she have to know that? I couldn't deal with telling her that. And when I attacked her, she didn't at first realize what was happening. It didn't go through. She had very heavy coveralls on. It knocked her right up into the lid of the car, but it didn't pierce the clothing. So it wasn't that swell a knife anyway. I went out and bought a, a pawn shop huge knife. And uh, I kept on just mindlessly attacking. She falls back into the trunk. I just killed a young woman. I slammed down the lid of the trunk. She isn't dead. She's dying. And I panicked. I thought, I just locked the car keys in it because I can't find them in my pocket. Oh, my God, I locked them in the trunk. I'm kicking on the trunk lid and yanking on it. Oh, no, I don't believe this. I started to run, and I tripped over the gun that I'd had in my pants that I had totally forgotten was there. I stopped. I said, stop and think. I collected my wits. Check all your pockets. I picked the gun up. I stuck it back in my pants, now remembering I had one. I checked all my pockets, and there's the keys in the back pocket. I never put them in my back pocket. Everyone makes mistakes, and that's what we have to hope for. The more mistakes they make, the better, better their chances. I thought I was pretty slick, and went and tripped all over myself, that first two murders. The first 24 hours, there were three clear times I should have been busted, and I wasn't. Because three different individuals or three different groups of people got scared and minded their own business and looked the other way. Some of the people who are committing murders, even as we speak, if they're doing it by themselves and they tell no one about it, they could go on undetected until they decided to stop. And the police wouldn't catch them unless we just happened to roll up on them while they were doing it. Even after police warnings against hitchhiking and an increased bus schedule on the campus, Kemper had no trouble picking up hitchhikers. Ironically, one warning advised riding only in cars with university stickers. Kemper's car had such a sticker. My mother worked at the campus, and I had an A sticker on my car, and obvious access day or night to the campus. I was picking up some very lovely young women. You know what we were talking about as we're driving around? Almost as often as not, this guy that's going around doing this stuff. And the second they started talking that, they didn't realize it, but they were getting a free ride. I couldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole, I swear. You know, but they'd be telling me what all about this guy, and they're comparing notes and speculating on what he looks like, how he carries himself, why he's doing this stuff, telling me about it. So how come they get in a car with somebody at that time? She judged me not to be that guy. I didn't look like him. It was getting easier to do. I was getting better at it. I was getting less detectable. I started flaunting that invisibility, severing a human head, two of them, at night in front of my mother's residence with her at home, my neighbors at home upstairs, their picture window open, the curtains open, 11 o'clock at night, the lights are on. All they have to do is walk by, look out, and I've had it. Why did you keep the heads? Why did you cut them off, and why did you keep them? Something out of my childhood. Uh, I could put it on an incident. I mean, my father chopping the heads off of our two pet chickens and my mother insisting that I eat them for dinner. Uh, <laughs> you know, we could say it was something that simple. I don't think it was. 
Now, my dad heads out back with a hatchet. I got on my bike and I rode I tried to stop it, I remember that. I got on the bike, rode around the block. I was crying. I haven't talked about that for a lot of years. I'm sure that may have implemented something, that may have gotten something rolling but along fantasy lines, but it took a lot of years of development along those lines to really get off. But how are you able to, in one minute, have someone's head in your hands and very shortly living thereafter. Living through a fantasy, however that would relate to that severed head. And, and then five minutes later, I'd put that away and th there'd be a knock on the door and I'd put it away and answer the door and the landlady would be there and we'd discuss it. Discuss what? Reality. Her reality, not mine. Some people go crazy at that point. I felt it. It was one hell of a tweak. I mean, to just flip out and not know where I was to be walking up the stairs with a camera bag that belonged to a young woman that had her severed head in it. Walking up to my apartment past a happy young couple coming down the stairs who nodded and smiled at me as they went by. Good evening. And they're going out on a date where I'd love to be going. And I'm aware of both of these realities and the, dis the distance between those two is so dramatic, so amazing, so violent that really, I could feel the wheels squeaking inside. That was really pulling on it. And I imagine at that point some people break. But I didn't literally go insane. I didn't get lost. And all this time, Kemper was able to seem normal. He even hung out at a bar across the street from the courthouse, making friends with policemen, trying to pick up information. They'd buy me a beer, I'd buy them a beer. Uh, casual relationships but that was I was poking around a little bit trying to find some things out I knew they wouldn't be privy to hot information but there were some things that were bothering me like were there any speculations on how they were dying did the cops like you like I said a friendly nuisance I got in the way and it was deliberate again friendly nuisances are dismissed how did you get the knowledge to outsmart the police watching television Believe it or not, Joseph Wambaugh, police story. Got some tremendous insights into not just the gimmicks, the actual things, the tidbits that you would pick up from their procedures, but the mechanics behind that, the logic behind it, was I would not allow myself to walk into even a potential trap of behavior. And one of those was talking about those crimes too much to people, initiating conversations about that. There was a uh, memorial service for two of the victims. Yes. Were you tempted to go? Yes. But? I'd uh, seen one too many episodes of one too many crime shows where that is one of the available resources for clues. Tracking down the attenders. Take one man taking pictures of the people there to eliminate his potential suspects. Some police department, now they actually came to your house to pick up a handgun. Sheriff's representatives. One of the detectives was upset because he heard I had a 44 Magnum pistol and was a convicted mental patient and 